Welcome to Hard Talk from the Hay Literary Festival in Wales. Today, I'm joined by a packed audience eager to hear from the American politician who defied conventional wisdom to inject passion and radicalism into last year's US presidential election. No, not Donald Trump, but the self-styled socialist who challenged Hillary Clinton for the Democratic Party nomination, Bernie Sanders. Now, his movement didn't carry him all the way to the White House, but has he planted the seeds of a revolution in American politics? <laughs> Bernie Sanders, welcome to Hard Talk. Great to be with you. I think we have to begin by reflecting on what happened in November 2016. Can you explain to me and explain to this audience how come Donald Trump was put into the White House by voters, many of whom were those working class, blue collar Americans that your campaign was all about? Explain it. Well, let me explain it in two ways. First of all, it is important for everyone to remember that while Donald Trump, of course, won the presidency because he won the majority of the electoral college, he lost the popular vote by almost three million votes. So three million more people voted for Clinton than voted for Trump. Number two, uh, I think, and what I say very often, is that it wasn't so much that Trump, who, by the way, was the most unpopular candidate for president in the history of the United States, very unpopular. It was not so much that Trump won, but that the Democratic Party lost. And by that, I mean not just the presidential election. The Republicans now control the U.S. House, the U.S. Senate, almost two-thirds of the governor's chairs in America. And in the last nine years, running against a party that has moved extremely far to the right, the Republicans, Democrats have lost almost 1,000 seats in state legislatures throughout America. So the real question to be asked is, what has happened to the Democratic Party? Why is its strategy and its message failing to such a significant degree? Second part of the answer is that, and, and tied to the first part, is that while the economy in the United States under President Obama absolutely improved over that eight year period, unemployment went down, deficit went down, a lot of other improvements. The truth of the matter is that millions and millions of Americans were left behind amidst the global economy. In other words, what Trump saw is there was a level of desperation not being dealt with by the Democrats. And do you accept a level of responsibility for the f what you call the failure of the Democratic Party? I mean, I know you ran against Hillary and you portrayed Hillary Clinton as, frankly, part of the problem, as an elitist Democrat who was out of touch with ordinary Americans. You said she was far too much in hock to Wall Street and the big financiers and the corporate interests. But in the end, you backed Hillary. And do you accept your part of responsibility in the democratic failure? No, actually, I think that the transition in the Democratic Party that we're seeing today echoes much of what I have been saying for the last 25 years. Uh, and I think what Democrats now understand is you cannot go to working people who are living in desperation and say that you are for them at the same time as you're taking huge amounts of money from Wall Street, the insurance companies, the drug companies, and the fossil fuel industry. But do you in any way regret the lumps you kicked out of Hillary no, Clinton? No, Because if you had not, she might be in the White House No, today. I don't accept that at all. And what I accept is the fact that our campaign brought millions and millions of people into the political process. Donald Trump didn't need me to understand that Hillary Clinton gave speeches before Wall Street. Didn't need me to understand Hillary Clinton's record. But what we did in our campaign, to a large degree, is created a whole lot of excitement, and some of that excitement came into the Democratic Party and came into Hillary Clinton's campaign. 
You have an analysis of politics, not just in America, but across the world, but let's stick to America for the moment, that seems to me, in a sense, quite old-fashioned. You talk a lot about class, about economic... That is old-fashioned? <laughs> if it is old-fashioned to say that the very rich are getting richer while most everybody else is getting poorer, if that's old-fashioned, then old-fashioned is absolutely correct. The truth is, not that my ideas are old, but the truth is that politicians all over this world are running away from the basic issue that billionaires increasingly control economies and political systems all over the world. But hang on a minute. Working class Americans... <laughs> working class Americans in their hundreds of thousands, nay, millions, in states like Michigan, Wisconsin, and the so-called Rust Belt of America, they voted for a billionaire. They did. And to, to my mind, the major reason that many working class people voted for Donald Trump is the following. As I said a moment ago, the economy improved under Obama. But the truth is that many people were left behind. So you have over the last 40 years, tens of thousands of factories in the United States that once provided people with decent wages, decent benefits, they're gone. And you have towns in America where Main Street is boarded up, where young people are leaving those towns. You have half of older workers in America today, as they approach retirement age, do you know how much money they have in the bank? when they're 60, 62, for half of older workers in America, they have nothing in the bank. They are scared to death. You got young people leaving school, $40,000, $50,000 in debt or more. So my, my response to you is there is a lot of pain in America. And Donald Trump addressed that pain. He said, I'm going to be a different type of Republican. I hear your pain. I am going to take on the establishment, the politics, the political establishment, economic establishment. You know what the only problem was? Donald Trump lied, and he had no intention he, of doing that. He didn't lie on everything, and on some issues, he actually was not a million miles from Bernie Sanders. He railed against globalization. He railed against the trade deals which Obama and the Clintons had backed, including the North America Free Trade Agreement, the yep. Trans-Pacific Partnership, yep. in just the same way that you did. Right. And he has not lied. He has delivered. He has backed off the Trans-Pacific Partnership. No, he says he's going to renegotiate NAFTA, and in that way... It seems to me your class-based analysis and your left-right language doesn't actually explain what is happening in America today. No, I think it does explain it. And the fact that Trump understood that when we are running up a huge trade deficit, when many corporations are shutting down and moving to China and Mexico and throwing American workers out on the street because they can get cheap labor abroad, it is true that many Democrats supported that. True that Bill Clinton, under the Clinton administration, that was developed. I voted against that. And you're right. Trump is right to point out that those trade policies have been extremely bad. But so, where so he lied, where he lied is he said, I'm going to be on the side of working people. Well, he's not. If you look at the health care proposal that he is supporting, if you look at the budget that he is supporting, these are disastrous proposals for the working people it, of this country. Right. It, but it's not even just about economics, is it? It's about culture and identity as well. And it, it seems to me that Donald Trump, even though he is mega wealthy, he's very anti-elite. He hates the elites. At least he says he does. Really? Uh, well, that's news for the American people. He just appointed virtually all of the elite <laughs> to his administration. He has more billionaires in his administration than any president in the history but, of the United but, States. But, but my point isn't really about Trump. It's a getting back to your, your analysis of your own, well, I was going to say your own party, but interestingly, you're actually a, an independent who that's chose right. to fight in the Democratic primary. That's correct. You, you're not a long-time signed-up Democrat. Right. But, but if you look at the language of... Hillary Clinton, she used the word deplorables about Trump yes. supporters. Look at Barack Obama after one of the terrible uh, gun, gun murderous incidents in the United States. He talked about bitter people living in middle America with their guns and their religion. Words that he later regretted. But suggest that there is something about the, the liberal professional outlook which does not connect with ordinary folk in much of your country. And I, I'm not sure that even you necessarily connect with some of those people either. Well, thank you, <laughs> but I would respectfully disagree. I think we do pretty well with working people throughout the United States of America. 
And I think that many working people understand that there is something profoundly wrong when they are working longer hours for lower wages, and in the United States, 52% of all new income is going to the top 1%. The American worker understands there's something absurd about the fact that he or she cannot afford to send their kids to college, but the United States Congress bailed out the crooks on Wall Street after they helped destroy the global economy. So I think we do a pretty good job, not perfect, but I, I'm proud of the record that I have in support from so many unions and millions of working people throughout my country. Do you, do you still call yourself a, a, social, a, democratic, a democratic socialist? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And for you, redistribution is a key to, to economic I reform. Think, I think, Stephen, that from an economic and moral, and, and the Pope, Pope Francis, who I have a lot of respect for, raises this issue in a very profound way. We as a nation, my country, has got to ask ourselves about the morality of a situation where the top one-tenth of one percent now owns more wealth or as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent, where 52 percent of all new income goes to the top one percent, where globally top one percent now owns more wealth than the bottom 99 right. percent. But I'm less interested in the top one percent or zero one percent, the billionaires and the multimillionaires. I'm interested in professional people who in the United States might be earning a hundred thousand dollars a year, yeah. in the UK it might be eighty thousand pounds, whatever. Here's the problem, and there's some fascinating research just been done by the New York Times, looking at the Democratic Party I itself. saw that article. You saw that article? It's one of the dumber articles that I've read in a long time. Well, I've read I'll tell you, let me just quote a little bit of it to you in the audience. Those in the top 10% of the income distribution voted 47% for Clinton as against 46% for Trump. In other words, the, the, the rich and the professional and the moneyed and the comfortable are Democrats just as much, if not more, than they're Republicans. So it's not about them well, and us anymore. No, Stephen, I'd happen not to consider somebody who makes $100,000 a year rich. What I happen to be terribly concerned about, and we cannot run away from this issue. You may not be concerned about billionaires. I think you should, because I think the growth in the United States in the last 17 years, you know what we've seen? We've seen a middle class shrinking. We've seen 43 million people living in poverty, and we have seen a 10 times increase in the number of billionaires. But, but, but let, let me interrupt for a sec. What I'm concerned about is where you win uh, or you gather together a winning coalition of voters. Because for all of your achievements in 2016, you didn't win. And Donald Trump is in the White House. So going forward, how does the left, the sort of people who support your views, how do you translate big support, young people coming, flocking to your well, rallies, everything else, how do you transport that into a winning formula? Because you've got to, in a sense, persuade people who are comfortably off to be no. altruistic no, and no, to no, no, actually no, no, no. I, accept. I understand that article, and it's, it really is quite incorrect. But let me... Just say this. But you do need people to be altruistic. You need them to say to themselves, no, you need people I'm going to, to let fight Bernie for tax their me own. more. No, wait, wait a second. What the article got wrong is that it said, Bernie Sanders is going to tax everybody. What they forgot to talk about in that article, and by the way, we're writing a response to it, is that much of the tax revenue goes to providing health care to all people and will save tens of millions of middle class families substantial sums of money. Right now, you have a middle class family, and again, I know it is hard for folks in the UK to understand this absurdity, but in America, you had a middle class family, husband, and wife, two kids, you could be paying $15,000, $18,000 a year for health care. Our health care proposal eliminates that. Yes, ask them to pay more in taxes. Unfortunately, the author of that article forgot to mention but that aspect. Just a couple of quick fire questions on American politics, and I want to broaden it out to some global thoughts. But on American politics, some were puzzled by particular stands you took. One was on your refusal over years, actually, to support the more radical proposals for controlling gun ownership in the right. United States. Did you do that because of this identity politics I talked no. about? Did you do that because you thought no, that would that. appeal to working class, no. blue-collar no, Americans? No, I did that because I come from a state that has no gun control. Zero, virtually none. But I represent a state where there is virtually no gun control. And, and when, by the way, 
the crime rate and the murder rate, thank God, right, are but very low. In rural Vermont, you have your TV and you switch it on and you see the terrible events at Sandy Hook School and a whole host right, of other terrible, record, terrible... And my record on gun control has been a strong record. Uh, not You've repeatedly uh, refused to back the, the measures that some call the, the Brady measures right. to impose strict limits on... Well, we can go into that at length. But by and large, I received, if my memory is correct, about a... I think it was a D-minus voting record from the NRA. So I don't think that that makes me very right. sympathetic to their point of view. Another specific question, and, and I, we've talked a little bit about winning support, getting great grassroots activism on your side, but translating that into victories. Even today, even though you're still crisscrossing the country, getting people out, supporting you, building the movement, I looked at the record recently. I mean, you, you had a candidate, I mean, a, a close associate of yours was trying to take over the chairmanship of the California State Democratic Party. You lost. Well, you well, 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 one second. You know, we lost. In other words, in California, tens and thousands of thousands of young people stood up, not young people, and working people in unions stood up and took on an establishment which has run that party for a very long time. And you lost. Yes. We were not successful this well, time. Well, it's called losing, yeah. Well, when you take on people who have an enormous amount of power, you do not win on your first shot. There is no debate. If you look at what's going on in the Democratic platform, you know what's in the Democratic platform? 90% of what I campaigned on. Do you know the legislation that's coming forth from Democrats right now? Very much what I campaigned on. We just last week introduced but legislation that would raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. We are fighting and will introduce legislation with national support to guarantee health care to all people through a Medicare for all single payer system. So if your point of view is that overnight you can bring a political revolution to the United States, I don't think so. I never thought so. And I think no serious political observer thinks so. Is, that is the momentum with us? Damn right it is. And is that your way of... <laughs> is that... Is that your way of signing to me and this audience and the world that you have no intention of backing down? You are going to be running for president again. No, I didn't say that at all. What I said... Well, you I just am... said, you said, you know, this is a long-term process. One shot, you said, does not solve this problem. No, I didn't so... say one shot. What I said is that one campaign is not going to change the world. Look, we are taking on an establishment. That means we're taking on a Republican Party that is backed by multi-billionaires who have endless amounts of money to spend. We are taking on a Democratic Party, which for the last 30 years has moved to the right, lost its contact with working people and young people. Now, do you think overnight we're going to bring victory? We're not. Many of your people will want to know whether you're going to run again. But it's in too early to talk about that. One of the problems that we have in America is that media focuses on the easy stuff. Are you going to run for president? I'll tell you what I'm doing right now. What I am doing right now is taking on Trump's disastrous health care proposal that throws 23 million people off of health insurance. I am taking on his budget, which gives two and a half trillion dollars in tax breaks to the top Let, one percent and makes massive cuts to the needs of working right. people. Let's talk about other aspects of, of what Donald Trump has offered the American people. But again, it seems to me relevant to what we hear from many political movements in Europe and elsewhere as well, particularly movements that would traditionally have been characterized of the right or of the far right. They, what they are doing at the moment is uh, telling a narrative which weaves together nationalism, protectionism, and to some extent, a fear of immigration. Mm -hmm. And it is a powerful cocktail. You could argue that that narrative was powerful during the Brexit referendum in the UK. You could, you could argue that it's powerful in Eastern Europe, in countries like Hungary. It's certainly got an airing with Marine Le Pen in France. In some ways, it is the right and some elements of the far right who appear to be using language which many ordinary people can relate to. Well, but you know what? There's nothing new about that. I mean, here in Europe, you should be more aware of the role that demagogues have played for a very, very long period of time. What demagoguery is about, and what you are describing, whether it's Trump well, that's your or word, Le Pen, not mine. that is my word. Well, I'm, my, you, my, excuse my point me. Is simply... Excuse me. I understand what you are saying. What demagoguery is about is scapegoating minorities who have no power, who are saying to people who have lost their jobs or are working longer hours for low wages, it is the Muslims 
who are responsible for you losing your jobs or working for low wages. It is Latinos in the United States who are responsible. The antidote to that is to create a powerful movement of working class people who have the guts not to scapegoat minorities, but have the guts to take on the billionaire class that we should be talking but about. But in a sense, what interests me about you, <laughs> what interests me about you is that in some areas, you are not afraid to enter the territory that, that, for example, in the United States, Donald Trump is in, which is talking about protectionism. You, well, first of all, I would suggest that many of the ideas, or some of those ideas, weren't Trump's. Those are ideas that I have been talking about for years. You use the word protectionism. I use the word bad trade policies. Is trade a good thing? Of course it's a good thing. You want to trade? I'll give you a dollar, you know, and you give me $1,000. How's that, a good trade? Well, Let's make that trade. It would be good for you, yeah. yeah. It would be good for me. Who do you think writes these trade agreements? Do you think it's working people? Do you think it's people working in factories? Do you think it's small farmers? The people who write, and I know this, believe me, because I am there. These are the executives of major multinational corporations, the drug companies, and Wall Street. They make those trade agreements. They work for those people, and they are often quite bad for ordinary Americans. So trade is a good thing. Let's do trade, but let's do trade that helps working people on both sides and not just Wall Street and the multinational corporations. A, fi a final couple of thoughts about the United States today. I was taken by something Barack Obama uh, said the other day. He was talking about his view of America. He talked about a big, bold, inclusive, dynamic America, the America we love so much. It seems to me that America doesn't actually exist right now. First of all, let us be very clear. Donald Trump is not America. And on it, but that, No, 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 no. One second. One second. One second. No, because I, I don't agree with you. America has come a very long way in many areas. The fact that Barack Obama, an African American, was elected president in 2008, re-elected in 2012, that was something that people 30 or 40 years ago never would have believed could have occurred. So if the issue is, do we have racism in America or in the UK, duh, of course we do. But have we made significant advances in combating racism? Yes, we have. We have done a good job in combating sexism, still got a long way to go. We have done a good job in combating homophobia, still have a long way to go, but I'm proud that in America, we are a more inclusive society. This is just a stat that seems interesting to me. Nearly three quarters of Republicans identify themselves as white and Christian, and they see their America being eroded day by day. They, white Christian America represents only 43% of the population right now. There is this sense of a polarization and a great deal of fear amongst different parts of the America today, that we see today. Well, there is a lot of fear, and there is fear for good reason. If you were 62 years of age and approaching retirement in three years, and you were one of the half of older workers in America, had no money in the bank, you know what, you'd be afraid. If you were a kid graduating college at $75,000 in debt and couldn't find a decent job, you would be afraid as well. If you were a single mom making 30000 and spending $10,000 a year on childcare, you would be afraid as well. So I think there is a lot of economic anxiety, which then translates itself into cultural issues. But to answer your broad question, there is no doubt in my mind that over the last 50 years, the United States has, in fact, become a more inclusive society. Bernie Sanders, we have to end there. But thank you for thank being you. on Hard Talk.